I would like to yeah, to ask you for for your opinion about uh, first of all Detroit. I mean that's the, the most famous one. What is that the Detroit uh, the Detroit sound? What does what what is it like? Well, you know Motown. I mean D Detroit. D the, what they were doing at Motown, I don't think has ever been done before or since. I mean Motown was really a hit factory. I mean in the way that I don't think anybody ever else had a, a hit factory the way that they did. They had you know obviously Barry Gordy at the helm but they had Smokey Robinson who was un I mean it's it's really hard to um, contemplate how prolific Smokey Robinson was you know Smokey Robinson wrote thousands of songs you know and you hear you know some in incredible Temptation song or some incredible Marvelette song you know or a Marvin Gaye song or something you look underneath it man you see William Robinson you know Smokey was writing for everybody you know And um, then later you had Holland Dozier Holland, you know. So they had they had these staff writers and staff arrangers, you know, and staff producers and staff engineers, and they had these studios, and they would just book these sessions, you know, you know, three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. They had all these, they had the house band, you know, they had um, these musicians, and they were just rolling them out, you know, as 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 quick as as they could make them. They were selling them as, you know, they were just cutting them themselves and. And putting them out, and they sold a lot of records. You know, they sold a lot of records, and it's um, it's very different from you know, Stax was a, a different kind of animal. Stax that was was smaller, and I think Stax was 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 more family related in some ways. And I think for Daptone, it's business wise, it's I think it's more of an inspiration for us the way that they were doing stuff. Um, it, it's just a little smaller and raw and stuff. The, you know, Motown was very very pop. You know, they were selling millions and millions of records. You know, these Supreme, Supremes records and stuff like that. They were just selling millions of records. And uh, I mean, they were unstoppable. I don't think there's ever been a label like, like Motown, you know. And that sound, their echo chamber and the tambourines and the stomping. And, um, you know, the sound of, you know, James Jameson and, you know, Pistol Pete and these guys on the record. It was very distinct, man. Nobody made records that sounded like that. You know, people, people tried. When you find a record that's not on Motown and it sounds like Motown, it's usually from Detroit, and it's usually because those guys took off in the evening and, you know, secretly did another session. You know, I mean, it was really, it's really a, a sound inherent to, to that family of people. You know what I mean? I think that was the, that's the great thing with, with some of these labels, you know, and some of these regional music scenes, you know, whether it's Detroit or Philadelphia or Memphis or New Orleans, um, you know, or Chicago. You know, the, these places had, had, um, They really had a sound to them, you know. People who living in a certain place, living together, hearing music a certain way, you know, working together for a long time, they developed a sound, you know. And that was one of the things for Daptone that was really important for us, for for Neil and myself, was we wanted to have a label that had a sound, you know, so that, you know, now people who love the label, people who are real fans of the label, we put out a record, we put out a new 45. You know, and they're not, well, what's that? What does that sound like? I wonder if I, they know they want it. You know what I mean? They want it before, before they even hear it, they know they want it because they like the whole sound of the label. You know, the label has, has um, you know, they know we're not going to put something out that doesn't, that doesn't feel like a Daptone record, you know? And we have a lot of records that we never put out. We have, you know, I don't know if you guys were at the studio or not, but we got walls and walls of tapes of songs and 45s albums that were never released, you know? Because they were good, but they weren't great. You know, what I mean, they didn't. They they were they were silver, but they weren't Daptone gold. You know what I mean? So so we leave them on the shelf. You know, we just keep working. You know, and we don't put out a lot of records. Only a couple, two, three albums a year. But you know, for us, it's important to try to keep a high standard. You know, we can't couldn't compete with you know Motown. Or, you know, those guys put out a lot of records, man. They really put out a lot of records. Like uh, before, ask you for comments on, on, on two or three other ones, like the the the. the um Like uh, Motown, they were often uh, also uh, criticized for like uh, taking uh, uh, the rawness that was within soul to to, to, to to the middle class, to the white, to the mm. pop, and and, and uh, like a, a way of uh, also a sellout of uh, of the African American experience. Do you see that? Uh? Well, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't see it that way. I mean, these, the thing is, on some level, these are academic points. You know, years later, you can look back at these things and say. Oh well, you know he, what was this demographic, and you know who was being sold what, and and um, yeah, I mean it was a pop label, and they were trying to cross over. You know they were trying, you know, especially with groups like the Supremes and stuff. They were they were trying to be able to connect to a white audience and to try to get on pop radio, but um, I don't know if that's selling out. I mean you have 
you know, African American singers, African American musicians, producers, songwriters, you know. You have African American people, you know, owning and running a business and putting that together and going out there and selling millions of records. I mean, I, and I think great records. You know, you listen to those records and they're amazing. You know, I listen to those, I listen to those records and I don't think, oh, they really sold out with that one. You know, it, it's, it's definitely more polished, it's more pop than Stax or something like that, but they're great songs. They're really incredible songs and the, the performances are great and the engineering is great and the singers are great. You know, the whole thing was great, you know. So, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't really see it that way. I, you know, I, I, think, I think that it's probably fair to say that they were intentionally trying to sell records and, and they, were, they were pop and they were trying to cross over and stuff. But, I mean, I think anybody that's helping, you know, more people hear better music, you know, that's a good thing, you know. Can I give you like, some names? Well, Martha Reeves, I mean, you're, you're, I mean that's still, still with, the, with the Motown sound, really, you know. Um, yeah, I don't the have a lot of Martha Reeves records. When do you think about Martha Reeves? Um, I, I would say probably Dance It in the Street or something like that, you know. I don't know, um, Martha Reeves is, is a, you know, she's a great singer, great Motown artist. I don't think she's, I, well, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't want to be unfair to her, but I, I would say I don't, I don't think she's quite as, as prolific as, you know, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, uh, the Temptations, or, uh, you know, even, even the, the Marvelettes or something like that, or Gladys Knight, you know, I think. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Gladys Knight. You know, lately I've been getting real into Gladys Knight. You know, I mean that's the the thing with 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 Motown. Like I was saying, they made so many records that you could be a Motown fan for 20 years, and somebody said, "Hey, hey have you ever heard this Gladys Knight song?" Like, no, I never heard that. Here's an album you never heard before. You know, I mean they put out so much great music. You know, um, like uh, Chicago occurs uh, uh, to me. You know, Chicago is interesting because I think Chicago. Similar to maybe L.A., but well, Chicago is kind of unique in this way. But Chicago was a scene of people that came almost exclusively from the South. You know what I mean? If you look at who were the big names in Chicago, or the great names, you know, you look at B.B. King, or Curtis Mayfield, or Bobby Womack, or you know whatever Lou Rawls, or Bobby Blue Bland, um, Syl Johnson. All these artists that were big Chicago names, they all came from the South. They're all coming from Mississippi and from Memphis. You know, they're all coming from the South, and Chicago was a place where they did business, really. You know what I mean? Chicago was kind of this business hub. I mean, it's like New York. Like, you know, everybody's from here, but nobody's from here. You know, everybody came from someplace else to get here, you know? So there's a, there's a, a heavy scene in Chicago, especially, especially as far as blues music, you know? Chicago had the kind of really the blues roots, you know? So I think a, lo a lot of great records were recorded there. A lot of rec great records came out of there, but you know, you know, the Impressions or any of these these great Chicago groups, none of them are really from Chicago. Originally, most of them were in, in the South, and most of them were playing gospel or you know or, or blues, and they kind of worked their way out there. You know. Um, the Motown artists. Do you wonder? Is there somebody you like? Yeah, yeah, I love Stevie Wonder, man. Stevie Wonder, I think, is is a. I mean, he's. I think he's one of the most unique artists in, I mean, it's, it's not a great word, but there's really nobody like Stevie Wonder. The way he writes a song, the way he plays a song, the way he sings a song is very distinct. I mean, the second you hear a Stevie Wonder song, you know it's a Stevie Wonder song. And uh, my favorite Stevie Wonder stuff is the stuff he did on Motown in, in the kind of the second half of the 60s, you know, um, the For Once in My Life album, I think is my favorite Stevie Wonder album. Um, but also the other one, what's the one where he's sitting on the stoop? And, he, and the, he's got, um, what's that song on there? Hello, um, oh man, I can't think of the song. But I, I mean, I love that, that, that era of Stevie Wonder is, is my favorite. Once, once you got into the, into the 70s, like in the mid-70s, you know, Motown moved out to LA and, you know, things started getting weird, the secret life of plants and stuff. A lot of people are real into that stuff. For me, that personally is not my favorite stuff. I was more into you know, in, into into the real, you know, the stompers that that, that uh, you know that, that he was doing in the, in the '60s. But I think the interesting thing about Stevie Wonder, to me, and again, I think Stevie Wonder was a genius, or is a genius, and I think his music is incredible. He's one of my favorite artists, really. I love I love Stevie Wonder songs. And you hear these records. He's an unbelievably talented musician, songwriter, singer. I love Stevie Wonder. That said, 
I think Stevie Wonder is the single worst influence on, on soul music. I think so many people listen to Stevie Wonder and hear the way he sings and the way that he moves f through these kind of jazz chords and they take away from it this really affected way of singing. This, this, this stuff you hear in modern R&B, it sounds almost like Middle Eastern music, you know, with, where it's just all this, or, this, this kind of affected ornamental singing. So when Stevie did it, it was original and it was, felt very soulful, but man, when I turn the radio and I hear that stuff, it just sounds awful. And I think a lot of, a lot of those modern singers are really influenced by Stevie Wonder somehow. You know, I think there's, there's, I think there's a lot of, I don't know if there's a lot, but I think there's, there's a handful of, of really great musicians, groundbreaking musicians like John Coltrane, for example, or, or Miles Davis or something. These people that did something very unique and they had their own sound, you know, and when they did it, it was new and fresh and beautiful. But 30, 40 years later, when people are still trying to copy, it just doesn't, doesn't sound good, people trying to do that. You know, people, it sounds very affected. It sounds artificial to me, you know. And I think Stevie Wonder was, was like that. I think Stevie Wonder is, had such a unique sound and was so strong as an artist that his influence actually, I think, maybe wasn't a great thing for the music industry. I think there's a lot of modern R&B singers. I wish they never would have heard Stevie Wonder. I wish, you know what I mean? I wish they could just sing a melody, sing a song, but, you know, they try to do what Stevie did, and you can't do what Stevie did, man. That was, you know, that was Stevie, you know? In Germany, all the young girls tried to sing, like, Whitney Houston or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, like, uh, like, you just said uh, John Coltrane, uh, Miles Davis, who has also been working a little bit on jazz music, and uh, um, about uh, uh, jazz, hipster comes to my mind, also a word that I uh, read in context uh, of you. Really? Uh, yes, the hipsters <laughs> from Brooklyn. Do you yeah. see yourself like, in this hipster uh, tradition? Man, you know, no, man, I, you know, I, not at all. Not at all. I, I don't see myself as, as a hipster or a hipster tradition. I mean, you know. I'm a father, you know. I'm a husband. I'm a, I'm, I, you know. I've always been kind of, you know, nerdy kid, man. You know, I'm not never been a hipster, man. But um, you know, I'll take it, whatever. If, you know, if 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 hipsters are gonna buy our records, man, you know, I, I'm happy they're listening to it. I'm happy they enjoy it. You know, there's something, I I mean, there's something hip about Daptone because it is very independent. You know, I think that's the thing that appeals, not just to hipsters, but to people that are listening to like punk rock music, for example. You know, Daptone as a label, you know, as a, you know, philosophy-wise, is very punk rock. Very punk rock. It's very anti-establishment, very much, in, very independently minded, very much about doing stuff on our own terms. And I think that appeals to, to, to the nature of people that are into punk rock or people that are hipsters or people that are political or people that, are, you know, have, have any kind of, of, you know, kind of fresh revolutionary kind of attitude they're gonna that's gonna appeal to them they, you know they make a connection to that you know and it's it's nice you know, I mean there's there is something innately po political about it you know what I mean about um, about rejecting the status quo and about rejecting what major corporations and major media machines are pushing and about getting all that and rejecting it not just musically but business wise and saying well that's not how we're gonna treat our artists you know, we're going to share profits with our artists. We're going to have a record, uh, uh, a record label that's owned by artists. We're going to have a record label, you know, where we're respecting the artists. The music's going to come first, and we're going to sell stuff based on connecting to our listeners. You know, get, making music for our fans and with our fans, and and um, you know, and everything else is peripheral. You know, and and that kind of connection, and you know, in in these times, it's revolutionary. I think. You know, I mean, in this in these times when there's so much overproduced, over manufactured, over over marketed, over packaged music that's just being artificially driven into the marketplace, you know, through radio stations and videos and TV shows and stuff, you know, by these major labels. When things are that artificial and things are that, um, you know, they're 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 not honest. You know, so for us to make honest records, you know, for us to get in the studio with real musicians and record something real, something that actually happened, the honesty of that, I think, in this environment, is is political, it's revolutionary, or something. And I think that that nature to it, that freshness to it, is something that 
you know, somehow maybe gets confused with hipness, you know, so, you know, I mean, I'd be happy to be a hipster, man, if, if they'll take me, you know, but uh, no, you know, I, I, what was it Groucho Marx said, I'd, I'd, I'd never join a club that would have me as a member, you know, so, I don't know. Um, talking about politics, uh